So good, good morning, friends. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to share my thoughts on uh, this topic of uh, role of forensics in personal data protection. Let me share some of my brief thoughts and uh, uh, in case any questions are there, we can always expand on that. <clears throat> okay, when we look at uh, the role of uh, forensics in personal data protection, I look at uh, two dimensions. One is that the forensic science supports certain aspects of personal data protection. At the same time, there are also conflicts in certain aspects. Of course, when we are talking uh, personal data protection here, we are aware that um, there is a law which is to protect privacy and therefore there is um, an effort to protect data. And in the process, we use technology and uh, on certain occasions, forensics comes into play. Why is that I say uh, that forensics is both a support and has conflict is? One is that uh, forensics by nature uh, is a science and of course art also you can say for digging for truth. See, we have a situation where um, some information has to be extracted from the systems and that is where cyber forensics comes into being. On the other hand, if you look at personal data protection, the basic concept is protecting disclosure of information. When we are talking of protecting disclosure of information, we sometimes don't distinguish between whether it is true or false. Whatever is the information about a data principle, it is always his choice whether it should be disclosed or not. For example, we talk of profiling. We did discuss about Cambridge Analytica and other things. Profiling is always considered a kind of thing which is anti-privacy. Now, when an organization does a profile, whether the profile is true or not, we can't say. It all depends on how good is the algorithm. So truth is not the essence of the profile created by an organization. It is whatever they believe is truth and they will use it for a particular purpose. Amazon may think I am a buyer of uh, a computer product and they may sell, send some advertisements. I may or may not be an, I mean, a computer uh, uh, buyer. So it is not a question of um, truth or untruth, but privacy always says that it is left to the choice of the individual. So that way, um, forensics wants truth to be found out, data protection <coughs> wants it to be disclosure to be restricted. That's why I feel there is a conflict between forensics and data protection in terms of the basic principles. Other than this, we do in the data protection arena, come across situations where we have to do an investigation, a data breach investigation. It is in those circumstances that forensics becomes part of the management of the privacy compliance or data protection compliance. Now, who invokes a forensic investigation normally? A forensic investigation in an organization may be invoked by an internal team as a part of the audit when there is a suspected or actual data breach situation. It can also be invoked externally when a regulatory agency like Data Protection Authority uh, or even the police would like to investigate. So these two situations are different. When we talk of either a support or a conflict, the situation also becomes um, relevant uh, in under different circumstances, whether it is an internal invocation of forensic investigation or an external uh, investigation. Now, all this thought process comes because privacy is a very complicated concept. Actually, privacy um, originates as a human rights concept. Uh, we feel that all democratic societies have to guarantee the right to 
um, chairperson uh, to be left alone. Uh, see, uh, the basic essence of privacy as defined, even in the Putaswami judgment is, of course, uh, the judgment per se did not define privacy. They only um, stopped at saying that privacy is a fundamental right. But some of the discussions are uh, the associated uh, views of judges in the same judgment did try to expand on the concept of what is privacy. Finally, privacy always comes down in terms of the human right concepts as a right to ensure that a person feels that he is left alone. What do we mean by a person feeling he is left alone? It is his mental state of mind. It is not necessarily a physical thing. That is, a person may be amidst a crowd but he may still be feeling that he is um, left alone because nobody around him knows who he is. So whatever he does is entirely uh, his uh, prerogative. Whereas if he, he is in front of people who know, who have a certain expectation of that particular person, then he feels that whatever he does is something which will create an opinion about himself with others and therefore he becomes conscious and he does not feel that he is left alone. So this is a mental state of mind which we call as the kind of privacy and we want to protect it. That is why it is part of the uh, good um, life uh, as a fundamental right. But unfortunately, Law cannot understand what is the state of mind of a citizen because each citizen is a human being and different from another. So what is good for A is not good for B. At the same time, the same person also may feel differently at different points of time of what he feels. So therefore today a person may feel that he has to be left alone. Tomorrow at the same time, if you ask him, uh, he may say that I want company. So therefore, to address this mental state of mind in an aggregated state of a whole country and frame a law is something like it's almost an impossibility. That is why the privacy lawmakers have to some extent compromised and said that, okay, we do not know for making a law, what is there in the average person's mind, but we will make a law to say that every individual will have a choice to express his desire of how his privacy should be perhaps protected at a point of time. This essentially means that 130 crore Indians will have 130 crore different preferences and if I, as a company or somebody is trying to collect that information, then I have to be conscious of these differences of choice of all these people. This is the human right concept of privacy converted into the right of choice, right of choice to control personal information. Now, this personal information can be in paper form, oral form, or in IT form. And most of the time we discuss today data protection in the context of the data, this personal data being in information form. In fact, it is because of the digitization of our world that the concerns about privacy has actually increased. When it was, when digitization was not to this extent, people did not have the same kind of concern. So the IT concept, that is when personal data is in an in information form, if you want to exercise the right of choice, then we need to actually prescribe that there is some information which we classify as personal information and the person who has who is transferring that personal information from one place to another place will have to say that his choice about how this information is to be used is A, B, C, D, E. Therefore, the person who is first providing the personal information 
will have to define his choice, which has to be carried through whenever that information is handled by other persons. And that other person who collects this personal data has an obligation to understand this choice and ensure that the choice is respected and is adhered to when this personal information is collected or used. This is the ID concept. So privacy in human rights concept is, a, is that an individual has a right to be left alone, which is converted into a right to determine how his private information or personal information will be used by other, other persons and that other persons, who, which includes the data uh, processors or the data users, they, their perspective is that I will understand the choice and then try to adhere to it in whatever I do. So that is where this becomes part of the data protection law. Now, the instrument of this privacy protection is, of course, the instrument called consent. Now, consent is a contract. The contract between the person who is providing the information, we in India call him as a data principal, and the person who first collects that information with a knowledge of why he is trying to collect the information and what he is going to do with it. That is the purpose and means of collection, whoever knows and he's collecting it, that person, we call him as data fiduciary. So the consent is a contract between the data principal and the data fiduciary. And this is normally given in term in the electronic world as an expression of uh, uh, the uh, request for, let us say, consent issued by the data fiduciary, which is what we call as privacy policy. And the person who, who is giving that uh, consent will say that I have received your request for proposal. I understand what kind of information you require from me. I understand why you require from me. I know how long you are going to keep it. And these are my rights of withdrawal of consent and so on. So I understand all this, and under these circumstances, I permit you to collect this information. So this request for consent is approved by the data principal, and the two documents form as a combination of an offer and acceptance, and it becomes a contract. And if the data fiduciary has to further take the assistance of somebody else to process the information as a part of his activity, we call that next person as a data processor and the data fiduciary passes on the information to the data processor again with the same conditions which the data principal has suggested. So this is the instrument of privacy protection which is normally used. Now, Again, there is one uh, problem here. The person, the data principal can only give consent to the information which he knows about himself. If I have certain amount of information which I don't know myself, because every person has got information which is known to himself, information which is about himself, which is already known to the public. And there are certain kinds of information which the person himself will not be knowing. In fact, that is hidden inside an individual. And sometimes part of this hidden information, which I do not know, may be known to an outsider. And there is some information which neither I know nor anybody else knows. So therefore, in this whole gamut of giving consent, there is one set of personal information which the data principal himself is not aware of. Now, obviously, what I am not aware of, I cannot give a consent. Therefore, the consent which is given, despite all this contract, etc., is deficient to the extent that consent can be given only about the information which the data principal is aware of. So when we talk of this 
profiling most of the time a profile is created by the data processor and i do not know what is the profile he has taken whether i will vote for this party or that party that is the profile which he has created and that i cannot give a consent beforehand because i don't know what kind of profile is being done maybe i will give a consent if it tells me this is what i think is your profile if i agree with it i can give a consent if it is not then i may say that this is not correct this is not what i am therefore don't i don't give consent for you to hold this as my information so consent has got this inherent problem that there are there is personal information of an individual which he himself does not know therefore consent cannot be given to that then in the process of uh, say collecting the information and then using it the data processors by virtue of the technology available to them may discover users which was not known when the consent was first obtained so this is one of the biggest problems in the data processing industry and also there is an it ipr issue here that when the processor generates value to the information given by the data uh, principal who is the person who owns the right to this additional value say the original information personal information is provided by the data principal so he claims that he is the owner of this information though the concept of ownership is slightly different here he gives a right uh, to the receiver of the information of how the information can be used so it is not exactly transfer of ownership it is a restricted license to use the personal information which is given but after it is given the processor generates some additional information either by aggregating multiple people's information or by making his own observation like any human being when i see the uh, another human being i immediately try to get something uh, like a face reading okay there may be face reading experts even those who are not experts we our brains are always trained to take some information from what we see and that automatically translates into a view or opinion if humans can do that machines also can do that machines can do it only with certain data which is fed into them in the process of developing a profiling algorithm and whatever has been prepared by some other person and through machine learning you might have even used artificial intelligence the processor sometimes get information which is not part of the consent so this information needs to be also covered and consent normally fails to address this issue so consent despite its um, usage fails in the form of not being able to provide con confirmation when the information is not known to the individual and also for the information which is created by the processor now when we come to a forensic investigation we are going deeper into the available information and we try to discover certain uh, things which are not even easily you can say visible to a set of users of the information so forensic person is an expert who goes below the visible layer and tries to get more information so obviously that information which a forensic person generates is never going to be something which can for which consent can be obtained so therefore the forensic investigator is really operating at a in a, a, a particular domain or a layer where the main instrument of privacy protection which is the consent is not going to be useful so if this is a scenario now what does our laws say we will take our personal data protection bill 2019 which is uh, and whatever i say may not be much different from what gdpr says but we will restrict to what we would like to look at from pdpb 2019 now pdpb 2019 provides certain exceptions 
for certain provisions for specific entities, saying that in such and such circumstance, consent is not required. So that is one grace for the forensic persons. Second is, of course, whenever something happens later, you can always go for a reconsent. But there are exceptions, and exceptions can be for the application of parts of the law, as it happens under Section 35, and it also may be specifically for obtaining consent uh, or not. So both these are there in our personal data protection bill, which are essential for the forensic specialists. For example, exception may be permitted for national security reasons. So if the organization which is doing forensics for national security purpose, maybe you don't have to worry too much about the consent. For the functions of the state, exceptions are available. For agencies which are specifically permitted for that. For judicial purpose, exceptions are there. Law enforcement purpose, there are exceptions. Medical emergencies, employment purposes in terms of recruitment, termination, and even evaluation during the employment. Then information security is a special category which, for which ex exclusion is provided for consent. Fraud prevention, even whistleblowing. In fact, many of the activities of forensics may even come under whistleblowing, particularly the internal forensic investigation which an organization orders on the basis of a suspected data breach based on your incident management register, that comes mostly under whistleblowing. So you should be happy to know that PDPB 2019 has looked at the requirement of the organizations and the forensic requirements to provide exceptions for fraud prevention, whistleblowing, information security, so that you know that the Data Privacy Act in India is not going to be a hindrance to the forensic community. However, there is a requirement of documentation under which a forensic investigator has to record that he is doing certain things. He knows that there is no consent for that, but I am doing this because it is in the legitimate interest of the organization or it is one of the permitted exceptions. So which means that every forensic investigator must thoroughly understand what is there in PDPB 2019. It is not peripheral understanding which a manager can uh, know, but like you do forensic digging into the data, you need to do forensic digging into what is PDPB 2019, what are the exceptions, and at the same time, perhaps be aware of any case laws and other things as and when they develop. Until they develop, maybe you may refer to GDPR, but don't get too much enamored with GDPR case laws in India, because GDPR is a different law in a different jurisdiction. As far as we in India are concerned, we are only concerned about PDPB 2019 or the Information Technology Act. Current law of India is Information Technology Act. When PDPB 2019 is notified, that becomes the act. GDPR is not relevant for us, except that you may say that, okay, internationally, this is the view. But we forget that for the time being, try to reinterpret everything from the Indian perspective. We should have a zero-based approach. We should not be too much concerned about what a supervisory authority in Switzerland thinks about what I do as forensics here. So we need to develop our own principles until such time where DPA can give you actual guidance. We need to develop this understanding on our own. That is why I always say that jurisprudence has to be developed by us as experts. Just following one case law or something like that is of no use because most of the case laws in emerging technology areas come up without a proper understanding of the situation by the two lawyers. And if the two lawyers don't understand technology, the judge also doesn't have an open understanding. Therefore, many of the court decisions come about with a less than proper understanding of technology. Therefore, jurisprudence has to be developed by technologists. And so if something is required for the forensic industry, 
the forensic investigators have to develop their own uh, jurisprudence. For example, if you have a community of forensic people, you should have started already with certain procedural documentation of SOP for forensics under the PDPB 2019 scenario. Okay, if you don't do it, you will be only taking what others give you. But if you understand the law thoroughly, then you will be directing the Data Protection Authority of India to give a specific guideline on how to handle forensic situations in terms of privacy. Why do we say this? Because in terms of without consent, presently PDPB gives the exemptions to the state. It gives exemptions to the law judgment. This I told you already, medical emergency and this employment scenario. Um, but what is important for us is that when we do a forensic investigation, sometimes what happens is I am trying to do something and in I automatically discover some other information. For example, I take a mobile. I am investigating a mobile. In that mobile, all my contacts information is there. This is what happened in Cambridge Analytica. Okay, in Cambridge Analytica, what happened was that the person collected the information for a specific purpose, that is a professor in uh, UK. And in the process, this information, which was bought over by Cambridge Analytica, they found an alternate use of profiling for the uh, political preference. And that actually created a new um, usage. So therefore, in forensics, the always, even if you take uh, something like a simple application like TrueCaller, if you become a member of TrueCaller, TrueCaller knows all your contacts name. So, now, do you have the permission to give that information? We don't know. Now, that is where consent fails in certain circumstances. And when you are investigating, let us say, a hard disk, obviously, you get across information which was not intended. You are going through a WhatsApp uh, message for, uh, say, um, investigating a drug deal. You suddenly get a Bitcoin-related information. So that, how to handle that? When an investigator comes to know that some information which was not intended to be discovered by him, now how does he react to it? Does he inform his uh, person who has appointed him saying that I got this information, now I don't want to give it back to you because this person does not, the data fiduciary who appoints this uh, uh, investigator has asked you to find a particular information like an employee's information, whether the employee was having, let us say, a pornographic uh, data in his email account. Now you try to extract that and there you get something about a fraud. Now, should you give that information to the employer or not is a situation which does not have a very clear answer. If you feel that the information is relevant to a cognizable offense, then you have a duty as a citizen to bring it to the notice of the law enforcement authorities, not necessarily the employer who has appointed you as a forensic uh, person. So this kind of a thing, how do you handle is the biggest challenge for forensic investigators. All this has to be controlled through the contract when the forensic investigator is appointed, you should foresee the possibility of unintended, unintended discovery of personal information about the same person or of other third parties and how the investigator has to handle it. One is, of course, an NDA kind of a thing, which he does not speak out to others, but even to his boss, that is even to the person who has appointed him, he need not necessarily reveal everything he finds out in a forensic investigation. And that has to be part of the contract. This is, I think, the essential part of the relationship of forensics with privacy, because protection of privacy is a responsibility of the data fiduciary. 
and it gets transferred to the forensic investigator. Forensic investigator in most of the circumstances is not a data processor. He is a joint data fiduciary. So when we call him as a fiduciary, he has got a trusteeship relationship with the data principal. Not only the principal for whom he is doing the investigation or his friends and others, like I told you, the contacts and other things. He is a fiduciary without being appointed as a collector of information. So the Indian law is very, very specific that by calling a person as a fiduciary, one data fiduciary transfers some responsibility to another who controls the means of processing. Purpose is given by the first data fiduciary, but the means is decided by the second uh, data fiduciary. So he becomes a joint data fiduciary. As a joint data fiduciary, he has got direct trustee res responsibilities to all the data protection, uh, data principles. This is the point which I wanted to make. And we have been discussing so many things about the section 35. Um, I feel the government has to have, should have certain rights. And we forensic people uh, need to actually Im get part of that rights only. If the government doesn't, if the law enforcement doesn't have a right of exception, forensic also doesn't have a right of exception. You have to close your business. You cannot do any investigation because any investigation will unravel uh, information or is likely to unravel information. And you don't know from whom you have to take the consent. So you cannot take the consent you get some information and therefore exceptions have to be built into the activities of the forensic specialist and a forensic specialist have to be given exceptions. The exception has to be given to law enforcement. If law enforcement has to be given exceptions, the government also should have the um, uh, leverage and uh, therefore our law has to be looked at in this particular fashion. Thank you.